So let's suppose you have a sigma double prime that is an infinite set. And you want to show that this infinite set implies some formula f. How are we going to show that, that our proof system can always handle these situations? Because our theorem has always been assuming that sigma double prime on the left hand side is always finite. So we have this current state of theorem, right? So we can able to show that these ideas are equivalent, assuming sigma is finite, okay? If my left hand size is infinite, then how do I going to fit it, okay? If I just put in double prime everywhere, it is not going to work because the theorem works on only finite and they're not extendable. So we need some extra trick, okay? You will be proving a theorem which says that if you have this situation, sigma double prime implies f, then there exists a sigma that sigma implies f and that will solve our problem. If that is the case, for that sigma, I can always generate a proof. So therefore, you will have completeness. The theorem will be uh, presented slightly differently. Theorem will be presented in the following form. So you here you're looking for one sigma that can play the role of implication for you, right? If all subsets of sigma double prime that are finite are sat, then sigma double prime is also sat, okay? How do I going to be useful here? What you will do is that you take a sigma double prime, take a union with not of f, okay? Now you will show that if this guy, all the subsets of this are sat, then this guy has to be sat. And therefore, uh, this implication does not hold right so that means there must be some finite subset for which you know the this this uh, sub uh, sigma is unsat and that sigma is going to be used here let us prove this theorem which is theorem about strings rather than about formulas and then we will use this theorem to finally prove uh, our theorem so how this theorem works let's suppose you have an infinite set of uh, finite binary strings. What are the binary strings? Strings that contain 0, 1, 0, the 1, 1, 0, things like that. Yeah, they're all finite. The set is infinite. Okay? So there exists an infinite string W. Okay? So you can construct a W string such that the following word. So just pay attention what does it mean. Okay? So for all n, so you take a prefix, n prefix, so you created this W which is infinitely long. For every n, you pick a prefix, okay? That is my wn. The claim is wn is prefix of infinitely many strings in S. You collect all the strings of set S such that w prime has a prefix wn. And set of those strings is will be always be infinite. Let's see how can I find such a W. So we inductively construct W. Okay? So for initially we have a like empty string W. Okay? And then it's, it's slowly, slowly we will build 1, 0, etc. And then we will get uh, the infinitely long string. And as we proceed, our set S will keep shrinking. Okay? So base case. Okay. So what is my base case? S0. Okay, so my base case is uh, all the collect all the strings that starts with zero and put them in this S zero set. Collect all the strings that start with one, put them in S set S one, and all the strings which does not belong any of this. This is only one possible string that is empty string, and if S contains an empty string, then put it otherwise as epsilon is is empty it is very clear union of these three sets is s right so it is by definition of s0 s s1 one of them must be infinite otherwise uh, how did union of these three things would be uh, be infinite so let's suppose s0 is infinite okay? so if s0 is infinite set 
then what do I do I expand my word by letter 0 and now call my s to be s0 okay now the my my set s has shrunk and w has expanded otherwise if w, uh, we say w equals to 1 and s is set to 1 by this definition we know w is prefix of all strings in the shrunk s induction step let us suppose we have w of length n and w is prefix of all the strings in s and s is infinite set uh, now again I divide my set S into three parts S0, S1 and S upside. What are these parts? You collect all the strings that have 0 in n plus 1th position and collect all the strings uh, 1 at n plus 1th position for S1 and in S upside you just take the current n length word which is w and see if that word occurs in s or not if not then s epsilon has that word otherwise it doesn't okay the union of these three will be s so again s0 or s1 is infinite and again whichever is infinite will be set to s and we will extend w by 0 or we will extend w by 1. Now again we have the situation w is prefix of all strings in the shrunk s. Okay, now s has been updated by s0 or s1 and whichever one was the infinite one and that one guarantees that you know uh, w is prefix of all the words appearing in s okay, and that's induction step therefore we can construct the required w and therefore hence the theorem already the theorem is very technical in nature therefore please pay attention to the details and how the the word of finite and infinite interact with each other and how do we handle with infinite objects and how do we argue about them A set sigma formula is satisfiable if and only if every subset of sigma is satisfiable. This is the theorem. This is the theorem for completeness we needed. And this theorem is called compactness. So compactness does imply completeness. Okay. So let's see how we are going to prove compactness. The forward direction is trivial. If sigma is satisfiable, every subset, finite subset will be satisfiable. Let's look at the reverse direction. How do we argue in the reverse direction? First, all the formulas in sigma are put in some order. Okay? So F1, F2, F3, F4. Okay? So some indexing order. This is possible because number of formulas are countable. Let P1, P2 be ordered list of all the variables appearing in sigma. And they are put in a particular fashion. Okay? First, all the variables of F1 are written down then this extra variables that may be showing up in f2 are written down then the variable which shows up in f3 but not were there in f2 and f1 written down and so on and so forth okay so this is the way it is being done is please pay attention to. And due to the rhs we have model mn such that mn satisfies the conjunction of all the formulas up to length n okay so you collect first n formulas and take their conjunction this is a finite subset of sigma therefore it must be satisfiable therefore there must be a model mn okay so now let's suppose you have this model mn using this model mn's you want to construct a model m that satisfies sigma right so you have a finite models in some sense and now you have to extend it to m so that's where that previous theorem comes in so let's see how to do it Okay, so we assume mn is only talks about only those variables that are occurring in the formula. It doesn't talk about anybody else. Uh, original definition of our models did talk about all the variables that are potentially being in your system. But let's restrict our definition here. And uh, because this gives you finite strings and the previous theorem was talking for finite to infinite strings. So that's 
I want to use that this variation. Okay. So, so we may see M and as finite binary strings. Uh, since variables are ordered P1, P2, something, the M and is assigning value to some first k variable. So let's suppose first n formula has k variables, so then M and would be assigning to value to that many variables and put them in a sequence of 0 and 1, and that will give you a string. Let s equals to be mn as a string okay? and n greater than 0. You collect all those strings, you get s. Due to the previous theorem, there is an infinite binary string m such that each prefix of m is prefix of infinitely many strings on nice. Okay, It's a very much mouthful and uh, it, it, it needs a few readings to really make sense what it is said. It's just restating the theorem which we have saw before. Now claim is you can construct a model M, okay, right, which is using the previous theorem that such that M satisfies sigma. Okay, let's see how do we do that. Consider formula M M F N, which is occurring somewhere in sigma. Up to F N has k variable. Let's assume that. Consider M prime be the prefix of length k of m. Our model m has infinitely many uh, values. So you just look at the first k. Okay? I call it m prime. Okay? This length is k. Right? There must be mj okay? because this guy must be a prefix of infinitely many strings. right? So there must be some uh, uh, mj in s Right, such that m prime is prefix of mj. That is because of this the previous theorem. And let's suppose that is the case. So m prime is this prefix of mj. Since mj satisfies this conjunction of formula 1 to j that includes fn, therefore mj must satisfy fn. Right? Since mj is assigned to more variable than the variables in m prime, so therefore m prime must also satisfy itself. Since m is an extension of m prime, the m must also satisfy fm. And since m is satisfying every formula in sigma, therefore m satisfies sigma. Now this theorem can be used to really uh, prove the our completeness theorem. How do we do that? Uh, we wanted to say that oh sigma implies f. What we do is that we say sigma union not of f is unsat. We want to show that. But since uh, it is unsat, there must be a subset of uh, of sigma. Let me call it uh, sigma prime, such that sigma prime union not f is unsat. If that is the case, then you can basically say that sigma prime improves f. And therefore, I can say that sigma improves f. That gives you completeness. If sigma is finite, uh, this is decidable. Okay? So decidable, basically, you draw the truth table, you, you have a decidable. However, if sigma in the left hand side is infinite, do we have decidability? We have completeness we have shown, but we may not have a decidability. Okay? So we have to understand a new concept which is called effectively enumerable and semi-decidable. If we can enumerate a set using an algorithm, then it is called effectively enumerable set. A set of all terminating program is not effectively enumerable set because there's no way to do it. There's no algorithm for it. A yes or no problem is semi-decidable if we have an algorithm for only one side of the problem. Answer is yes, then you can definitely give the answer. But answer is no, then you can't decide the question. Slightly confusing idea because you can say yes with confidence but not no with confidence. How is it even possible? Let's look at an example and that will convince you. Okay. 
So we will say if my sigma is effectively enumerable, then sigma imp implies f is semi-decidable. Due to compactness, if sigma implies f, there is finite set sigma naught subset of sigma such that sigma naught implies f. This is the implication of compactness. Since sigma is effectively enumerable, then you can say that all the formulas appearing in a, sigma can be enumerated g1, g2, g3, g4, right? Let S and B, the set S and B, the first N formulas are put together and call, give them a set of formula S and B. Okay? So there must be SK such that the sigma naught is subset of that K. As you as start collecting more and more uh, formulas, there must be some point you become superset of uh, sigma naught. Then if sigma naught implies F, then SK implies F. And then we may enumerate Sn okay, one after another and check if Sn proves F. This is a decidable question, right? This is because this is finite, this is finite, we can decide it. Therefore, eventually we will say yes if, if sigma implies F. However, if sigma does not imply F, this method is never going to finish because it is always waiting for somebody to become super set of sigma naught but sigma naught doesn't exist it doesn't know it doesn't exist so it will keep running if answer is no this algorithm does not finish but if answer is yes it will finish and that means it is semi-decidable